Hey there, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg, making all sorts of noise. This is bad, but it is what it is. So I'm super excited that you're here. I'm super excited that you're joining us for the third week in our Artist's Way project. I have with me Alan Fessenden, Megan Vasilis, and Sergio Giovanni. We're all talking about Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way. This is what we decided to do. We decided to go through the entire book and basically catalog the entire process for you so that you can hear how we go through it and maybe be inspired to do so yourself and actually go through it and see what the book and the process, the 12 week sort of creative recovery process that Cameron outlines in the book can do for you. The last couple of weeks, we have done uh, a wonderful, uh, if I say so myself, we did a wonderful, Alan and Megan and Sergio gave such great ideas and advice and guidance and shared of their experience going through the first week, which was sort of the beginning, talking about the basic tools. And then the last week was uh, sort of the first step in creative recovery, which was recovering a sense of safety. This week, we're going to talk about week two, which is recovering a sense of identity. I'm super excited to welcome Alan, Megan, and Sergio. Welcome, y'all. How are you? Hey, you doing Hi, great. Megan. Uh, yeah. Hi, Isolde. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Hi, Megan. Okay. Hi, Sergio. <laughs> It's it's been one of those weeks. I am super excited about about talking about this because this is this is one of those things actually. This to me has been a very challenging week. I've been working like 16, 17 hour days and then finding time to do all of the tasks and the exercises and my morning pages and my artist state and I've started writing a new book and things have been wackadoo for me. So I would love to see how you all are as far as how this week was and what you found was it challenging did you get your morning pages done how did it go for you i would love to start with alan what are your thoughts as far as how it went and where you are with the process so far <laughs> well this week has been absolutely crazy because uh they've been in cutting open my walls it feels like two long weeks since we talked about this but they cut open all the walls in my apartment to stuff insulation in there because there was like either ah. very little or no insulation in a lot of the walls so mm. i was just like <laughs> moving stuff for the the guys <laughs> and then moving it back so that it didn't feel like we, i was just like living in a chaotic environment ah. so i was like trying to like <laughs> make uh, order out of chaos every every day it seemed like they were here like three days but there was always some weird challenge so it actually took me a while to get to reading the the chapter and i was like oh my god i got all this stuff to do and there's stuff i was supposed to be doing all week like the um the affirmations and and such that i wish i had, had read earlier so that was a little bit crazy but i wrote most of my morning pages and i went on an artist date and i did at least some of the task i think so <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a challenging week, but uh, but uh, sure. I'm excited to be here with you guys and talk more about it. Awesome. Uh, do Do you want to share where you went on your artist date? Oh, sure. I went to see um, Spider Man. Oh, the new <laughs> uh, Spider Man movie, No Way Home. The new Spider Man, No Way Home, and I was I I knew this would be one of the artist dates I went on because. A friend of mine asked me to go see the movies a couple of months ago, and I just was not ready to to go. And I was like, "Oh, what's that's weird." Uh, not that it's weird. But I was like, "Okay, maybe," but then I was like, "No, I, I don't think I'm really ready to push myself to um, go into a movie theater right now." And <laughs> I don't know that this week was better, but I was I was excited about it because I I haven't been to the movies in you know a while. And going to the movies by myself was a very scary thing that I did in college. I remember just being like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm going to the movies by myself, but I want to see, like, I think it was Othello or something. And uh, I was like, oh, this is, it was a really awakening experience for me to be like, oh, I can be alone and enjoy a movie by myself and really have a different experience. And then I, I did that some years ago in Minneapolis a little alternative movie theater and that felt so cool and so i was just like 
oh, excited, excited to be back at a movie theater and just taking myself on this date and sort of plugging in. And it was, I went to the Nighthawk and it was exactly what I wanted to do. It had that sort of like special vibe to it. And that movie is really, <laughs> really good. And I'm excited to talk about it. To awesome. To. <laughs> I, I would, I would, maybe we will. <laughs> Maybe we'll leave it a little time at the end because I loved it too. Oh, good. Yeah, I, I, I thought you had seen it and I was like, oh, I want to talk to you about this. <coughs> yeah, I had seen it I, and, and it was super cool. Megan, how about you? Uh, yeah, so this was also kind of a crazy <coughs> week for me. And I, I also didn't do my reading until Wednesday. So I, I missed a whole bunch of days of writing affirmations in the morning pages. <laughs> but by the time I finally got around to that, um, it did actually help and it did... I, I could see it starting to change how I was approaching morning pages a little bit. And of the seven days, I did six of them, of three, three pages of morning pages, which was I thought was pretty good. And I think the experience was actually more rewarding this time around than before. I think because, mm. especially once I started using the beginning part to really work with the affirmations, I actually found myself spontaneously kind of using them to play with more with creative ideas that I had. Like I wrote this weird little story one day and like three poems one day, instead of just using it as a space to just like write whatever garbage was in my brain and complain about stuff. It was like, so, so that kind of felt like a, a, a shift for me that happened this week, mm -hmm. specifically after I started working with those affirmations. So that was really cool. And um, for my artist date, I kind of just, took another drive I went to this random location I found on the map and I ended up driving through this really really creepy um forest that that kind of looked like the setting of this southern gothic novel I was sort of imagining in my head as I was driving so it was kind of a it was kind of a quiet time but it, but I think that was really what I needed this week to just sort of escape the the chaos of everything else so that was that was a good experience too Wow, that's really cool. I love that you had the uh, a got you know where you are right now gives you the opportunity to find gothic novel settings. That's that's really cool. Yeah, that's cool. And yeah, I, I, the affirmations are really it's fascinating how suddenly they be they take on kind of a life of their own, and you have to sort of figure out how to use them. But it sounds like for you it was very natural. That's very cool, Sergio. How about you? What happened with you this week as far as the morning pages, the week that you had, the artist date, all of that stuff. Um, yeah, it was a pretty good week on my end. I don't think as wild as um, some of the weeks you've probably had. Um, I do want to say that No Way Home was great, and I would love to talk about that as well. <laughs> we should do um, a review very, episode. <laughs> for sure. Very, very emotional film overall. Mm -hmm. um, and Alan as well, I, I know what you mean about the, the fear that you might have or one might have going to like a movie alone. And I remember a few years back uh, going to a concert, which is one of my favorite things to do uh, pre-COVID was live music. And I remember going to a concert for the first time alone and how I was nervous and anxious about it, but I had a blast and it was almost a rewarding experience and it was it was awesome because then i was able to go to more concerts on my own and, and have a lot of fun um so that's cool i'm glad you got to enjoy the film on your artist nice. date thank you as far as my week i think um oh no worries as far as my week i think the morning pages were probably one of the most challenging things for me um i was able to do all seven days which i feel good about but I'll be honest, the latter half of my morning pages was a lot of me complaining about my morning pages. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I, I don't want to be here doing this. I'd rather be doing something else. I'd rather be writing something else. And there were a few times that I did take a break halfway through and then finished my morning pages later in the evening. And that didn't really help as far as, you know, me wanting to, to do them. But I'm going to continue them. And... Um, Hope that it gets a little better as far as uh, my motivation for them. For my artist date this week, um, for a few weeks now, I've been thinking about getting a haircut. So uh, I decided this past week that Friday would be my artist date. And so I went and got the haircut, uh, which always feels good. Although I'm a little self-conscious about all the forehead on display at the moment, <laughs> but it still feels good. And um, Afterwards, I went to pick up some takeout 
Um, and on the way, I stopped inside a dollar store, which um, she recommends as an example of an inexpensive art estate that someone can have, yeah. um, I think last week. And so I did that and I picked up a few things that I needed. And yeah, it felt good, the date overall. Although um, I will say the NYC winter has been a bit brutal. So that wasn't too much fun. Oh, yeah. I, I, I haven't set foot outside since Friday uh, <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah, because uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I have hypothyroidism and my body can't regulate inner, internal temperature. So once I get cold, it's hypothermia city. So I, I have to stay indoors on, on those days when it's really hot or really cold. Uh, but anyway, so, uh, so I, I, I noticed when we had our writers group meeting, actually, Sergio, that you got your haircut, which looks great. And I think the forehead on display is awesome. I think, I think that shows you have a big frontal cortex and that's a great means, forehead. Indeed. Yeah, and it's awesome. Great. I saw it so, great. So, uh, so, and the other thing, yeah, we should definitely do like a, re- a bonus review episode of Spider-Man <laughs> No Way Home. And it's funny to me, like commenting on both uh, you, Sergio, and you, Alan, your, your thoughts about going to a movies by yourself. I've been going to the movies by myself since I was 10 years old. And it's a treat for me. I don't have to. I don't have to discuss with anyone which movie to see. I don't have to discuss with anyone where to sit. I just go. And I used to do this when I was working in my twenties. I was working a pretty high, high powered, high, high importance job. And uh, and they knew that that once a week I was working ninety hour weeks. But once a week, like on Wednesday afternoon at two p.m., don't try to find me because I was seeing a matinee of something. And that was it. That was just what I did. And if they didn't like it, tough noogies. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, for me, seeing a movie by myself, so, since I love movies so much and other people don't want to always see the movie you want to see. So why not go by yourself? I, I salute you and applaud you for doing it. Uh, for me, this week was uh, tough. Lots and lots of work. Uh, on the podcast, I've gotten a bunch of voiceover gigs, which is great. There's a lot of stuff going on. But I did manage to go through the book. I did manage to do, I think, most, if not all, of the tasks. I did my morning pages every day. My artist date was at the library, the New York Public Library main branch, which is one of my favorite places in the world. And I was all set to go to the Treasures exhibit. They have this great exhibit called Treasures, which is all these cool things like you can see Charlie Parker's saxophone, things like that. And uh, unfortunately, because of staffing shortages and because of COVID, the exhibit was closed. Not one to be daunted. Yeah, I know. I was bummed. But then I went, but the gift shop is open. So I went in and I was looking at books and I bought myself a Ruth Bader Ginsburg action figure. So I now have that. And I now have a mug that is my new espresso mug, which is awesome. I, I That's one of the other things I did for myself. I bought myself on very huge sale a little espresso machine. So now I'm making myself espresso every day. And I needed a mug that was short and squat. And I found this mug at the New York Public Library gift shop, which is famous first lines so of, of books. And so I now have this mug as my coffee mug every morning, which is all of the greatest first lines of all the books. You know, it's like 50 first lines. And uh, and so I have that now, too. And that's awesome. And the the thing about uh, the the morning pages that I wanted to say, and this is something that I wanted to sort of comment on something you said, Sergio, if you are writing something that you that you're like, ah, crud, I don't want to be writing these morning pages. I'd rather be writing something else. You can start writing that something else in your morning pages. Right. Mm -hmm. You you don't have Mm -hmm. to keep writing this freaking sucks da, 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 da. what if if you want to start writing something that is pertinent to a song you're working on or a story you're working on do it you know fill up those three pages with that nothing wrong with that and in fact everything is right with that and for me what did i do i was writing my morning pages and suddenly started writing my next nonfiction book, which is a little weird because I'm in the middle of two nonfiction books right now, but this one has, it came up in my morning pages and I kind of went by, I guess I'm writing it. And uh, I'm already like seven, six, seven thousand words in and show no signs of slowing down. And it was, it, it began through the morning pages, but I also use the morning pages in another way. When I have things that, that bubble up from my subconscious that you have to remember to do this, 
I, I write it in my morning pages and I have these little symbols that I've developed. Like if I, if this is a, an idea to follow up on, I put a little spiral. If it's a to-do item, I put a little hashtag, you know, so, so if it's a realization, it's a little star and by the thing that I just wrote, that's really cool or that I need to complete or accomplish, I put those little notations for myself so that I can easily go back and find them. And yeah, I know she says, don't read them, but this is more like a, oh, I remember this. I need to remember this. And this is how I remember it by putting that little thing. So I don't re read the entire morning pages. I read the one little sentence that was, hey, Isolde, remember to do X. And that way I remind myself and then I move on. And the other thing that I got from from writing my morning pages this week is uh, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about my website, my sort of professional website and it was all about uh, how to redo some of the copy in my website so that it's focused more on where I want it to be and I can talk about that later if we need to but but the point is that when things come up for you when you first start you might go oh crap she says not to go back and reread them and I think she's talking about don't reread them so that you don't judge yourself for having written something that isn't quote unquote perfect but if something you write is is helpful to remind yourself or an idea or a realization, then I say save it. And one of the ways to save it is put a little mark by it so that you know that it's something you want to save. You don't go back and reread the entire thing, but capture that one piece of information that came up that you need to deal with or that you want to think about or that you want to do. So it's another way of looking at morning pages that is maybe because I've been doing them for well, since 1997, so a long time, but it might be helpful to you as you progress to think about it in those terms. I think that's um, really great advice, Kavilda. And I think it's amazing that you've made so much progress on that new book in, in so little time. It's really uh, inspiring, even. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's practically writing itself because it's stuff I've been thinking about for a long time. So that's really cool. But it's also now I have to go. Okay, stop brain dumping onto the page and figure out what your actual organization of it is going to be. <laughs> that's because I'm writing, 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 and then I have to go, okay, what what are the what are the sections of this going to uh, of this book going to be? And I'm going to have to think about that and really get it so that it's in in publishing form. So, that's that's the next step for me. But thank you. I appreciate that. All righty. So, thank you for checking in. And let's move on. Uh, I would love to talk about this this week. One of the things that she calls the chapter uh, recovering a sense of identity. And, you know, she talks about sort of self-definition as as the, the end-all be-all for this chapter and also the setting of boundaries. And I would love to talk to, to, to get your all thoughts. When she says recovering a sense of identity, what do you think she means and where do you think you are with that process? Uh, Megan, why don't you go first this time? If you have thoughts. Yeah, yeah definitely. definitely. So, so I did, I did have a lot of thoughts, thoughts about this because, because I really think that she's talking about, about how, how we conceptualize our own identities as creatives. creatives. And I think, and I think mm -hmm. for me, I've always, always had the idea, idea that I'm a creative, creative as, as, long as long as I can remember. remember. I've always created in a pretty, in a pretty natural, natural way. way. But what, what I haven't really been able to own is my identity as a creative who does that kind of maybe a who does, who does that in a more See, I'm, I'm, I'm having, having trouble, trouble even saying it now. Podcast, like, who, who is primarily a creative, you know, not just a creative, mm. a creative on the side. Um, mm -hmm, you can mm -hmm. kind of see how I was stumbling over my words there as I was talking about it. But that, that's what this chapter really brought up for me, that I've always created, I've always thought of myself as a creator. But um, part of really owning that is is understanding where that sort of fits into the bigger picture of your life and where you want it to go. And why why you think of it in that way and like what what other factors in your life have contributed to that so um there was really a lot for me to think about in in relation to that this week oh i'm so right there with you and and in fact i think we talked about this or i talked about this last time or maybe the first week we met about this book in in that thinking of I am an artist, sort of owning that identity. I am a creative, I am a writer, I'm a musician, I'm a whatever, rather than thinking of it as something that is a hobby 
and you do something else as your money earning thing and the creative part of you gets relegated to when you have time for it. And that's a big thing. That's a huge shift for you. So yay, even even thinking about it is super important, I think, that, you, that you're getting to that place where you're like, yeah, what does it mean for me to be a, a creative first? And to me, honestly, and this is a point I think we can all maybe think about and talk about, how much does your sense of identity as an artist, as a creative, move the needle as far as you believing that you deserve to be compensated, you deserve to, you're entitled to uh, success as a creative, in part because you think of yourself as one. What are your thoughts on that? Megan, I know you brought it up, so if you want to go first, and yes, I want to talk to everybody about this, but what are your thoughts on this question? Or do you want to wait until everyone has gone and then we can talk about this question? <laughs> no, 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 I, I have I have more thoughts. So um, okay. I, I feel like it's pretty crucial for me to really own that in order to kind of step into that. I feel like in order to create within your highest purpose, you can't do that halfway. At least I can't, you know? Mm-hmm, if I feel mm-hmm. like I'm, I'm half-assing it or, or that I don't deserve to create things on a really high level, then I'm not going to be able to do it. And I think that's what Morning Pages even showed me this week. You know, once I sort of let go of the idea that I was just sort of passing the time with the Morning Pages, that was when the more creative ideas started coming up for me because I was starting Mm -hmm. even in that small way to own it a little bit. And that was when that little piece of it started to come up, started to unlock for me. Mm Mm-hmm. And she says that that will happen, even though in the moment you might be in this place of like, doggone it, why the heck am I doing this? And then if you keep going with it, you will see things happen that are going to really surprise you. And I think that's an interesting thing because it, it asks for such a leap of faith on the part of the person going through the process. Sergio, do you have any thoughts on that? <clears throat> Um, Yeah, as far as what you just mentioned about her saying that if you just stick with the morning pages, then you'll see things happening or things changing. Um, As much as I was complaining about the morning pages before, I I feel like that is a possibility. And um, myself recently, I just started writing uh, a new short story that I'm I'm really excited about, more excited than I've been about um, for a short in a long time. And and I'm not sure if I can attribute that to a couple weeks of the artist way, but or the morning pages, but it is it is neat. And um, as far as recovering a sense of identity, because I think that was um, the initial question you posed, um, I really related to what Megan said about being a creative on the side and how that can be conflicting, and and just a lot of what she said. Um, but I definitely identify as an artist and have for a long time. Mm-hmm. But but more specifically, I think for me, it was identifying as a writer, um, which came to me really late in my life, even though I've been writing um, shorts and stuff like that since I was in middle school. It really wasn't until I was like a full grown adult. And I don't mean like 21 adult, I mean like much older, where I was like, yeah, this is, this is what I should have been doing. This is what I was always kind of meant to do, or I think at least. Um, so identifying um, as a writer, I think was something that came later for me. I hear you. And it's, uh, as someone who didn't start writing creatively at all until after I was uh, out of college, I completely understand where you're coming from that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, and she even says what you said about, I'm not sure if I can attribute this to the morning pages. She says that she says that in, in this chapter, even she's like, and I'm willing to bet that you're going to, things are going to start opening for you and you're going to go, well, I don't know if that has anything to do with the morning pages, dot, 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 you know? So it's really interesting that, that, that you said exactly what she says that probably you'll say in this week of doing the morning pages. So fascinating stuff. Cool. Very cool. Alan, what are your thoughts? Um, can you re- reframe the question? Well, I wanted to talk about Sergio, you thinking about being a writer late in life. And I've been thinking about that myself because I came to New York as an actor comedian and I think comedians are writers inherently, but I think mm-hmm. I just, I thought of myself as someone who can write occasionally, but it was always hard for me to say I'm 
I'm a writer. And when you say that to people, you're like, well, what do you, what have you written? Yeah. And it's like, oh, you know, <laughs> some shit here and there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah. then I have to remind myself that I've written three solo shows and I've written several Christmas uh, plays or uh, sketches, like sketch shows. And, mm-hmm. um, and then I used to write when I was young, when I was a kid in high school and stuff like that. And then somewhere in there, I think it was like in college where I just didn't want to write papers for people. <laughs> I was like, I don't know how to write. Or I be, I was such a procrastinator too. I just always, would always put it off. But then when I write, I have fun and I enjoy it. And it's like, oh, this is good, but it's so hard. I don't know. It's like a lie I told myself where writing is not fun or it's hard. And I think it's because it's a bunch of choices constantly. Um, but... <laughs> I don't know. I think coming, doing this process has made me start to think about all the ways that I used to write and how it's not like absurd for me to consider myself a writer at this point in my life, um, even though I struggle with it. (laughs) Sure. But I think that's that I don't know any artist who doesn't struggle with it. Right. You know, with whatever, whatever, with whatever chosen art it is, and it could be multiple art forms. They all struggle with it. It's really, uh, I, I'm in the middle of watching a phenomenal uh, documentary series on Netflix called Abstract the Art of Design. And there's an architect whose name I will absolutely butcher if I try to say it. He is Danish. And he said something really beautiful. He said, uh, and I, I'm just going to have to look it up, doggone it, because honestly, it was brilliant. So brilliant that I actually, I'm going to put it out as a meme very soon, but I completely fell in love with what he said. He said it's his name is Bjark Ingels, and he said the way that you realize your wildest dreams is actually one step at a time. And <laughs> when I heard that, it it blew me away. I was like, yes, absolutely. Why do we why do we put ourselves on this path of thinking that we need to have already achieved our dreams or that we're not doing it fast enough or whatever? And in my mind, that notion of, yeah, stone steady wins the race, you know, one step at a time is okay. Don't judge yourself for having taken that next step, whatever that is. So this is my new mantra. The way to achieve your wildest dreams is actually one step at a time. So I I just wanted to sort of offer that up to you as as you said that, Alan, and to to all of us listening or, 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 you know, here speaking. Alan, what about your thoughts as far as the notion of self-identification as an artist and also how this week has been for you with looking at that? Or has the week just been too busy and and you didn't have time to even go into any of that? Uh, no. Well, so you're asking me, <clears throat> how do I feel about self-identification as an artist? Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> uh, I definitely feel that I'm an artist and I think that's, or I feel like I'm an actor. I feel like a performer. I feel like I do a lot of, um, different creative things that, that that's always been my pursuit. And unless I <laughs> had chosen to be a doctor years ago or years from now, I'll be an artist <laughs> I think the rest of my Good life. Good for you. Awesome. And, but I, I understand that struggle to, to say that out loud to people and, and that, you know, like as a comedian, it's like, well, tell me something funny. It's like, absolutely not. <laughs> I'm not here to perform for you. I I need to get, I need to be in my safe space <laughs> to make my comedy. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I love it. But, um, so I, but I do, you know, I feel like rotating, as I said, like identifying as a writer is, is sometimes weird saying I'm an actor, saying I'm a comedian, all these things, they have like little, like, (laughs) like burst your bubble guys sitting around going like, are you really? Are you really? What have you done lately? What's your, what's your list? What's your latest success? Um, (laughs) and it's, I like, I like that they're from like, they're all, oh yeah, they're really judgmental in the forties and they. What's your latest success? What's what you've been doing now, huh? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it sounds like, you know, his name is Muggsy. Good old Muggsy yeah, yeah, yeah. talking oh, to you about uh, <laughs> what have you done for me lately? I don't know. Exactly. Uh, do, so... do, 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 do. <laughs> 
looking for a copper, see? Uh, so, you know, it's funny because this notion of not just self-acceptance, but acceptance of the fact that you are creative and that you're entitled to it. I Coming up on the show, I'm going to have Mike Kaplan, who's a comedian and he started out he started out as a musician and then made the transition and first he realized for example that he had funny songs and then he was like oh well maybe stand-up comedy is the way I'm gonna go and it's fascinating to me that we sometimes either hold on to a different identity or we try to make both work and then feel like we're short short changing one or the other Mm. and I feel like love what you're doing while you're doing it so so if you have multiple things that you are creative in then maybe you're just a well-rounded artist rather than someone who's putting themselves into a position of having to make choices all the time about which kind of art they're going to do there's something i think to be said for thinking about it in those terms all righty so let's talk yeah it's it's i i'm Especially for anybody who's a comedian, you're going to want to listen to Mike Kaplan's episode. He's phenomenal. He's done like, you know, Letterman and Comedy Central, and he's had his own Amazon special. He's a great guy, lives here in in New York City. He's amazing. But anyway, let us move on. Let us move on to the next question. (laughs) She talks about setting boundaries, and some of that comes out of actually being... You know, when you're an artist, that means you have to set boundaries for yourself as an artist. I, I am a, I'm a professional speaker. I walk out onto stages and I talk to other people about how to be creative or I do tarot card readings or whatever. And so people automatically start thinking that I am available to them in whatever form they want right when they want it. So for me, I had to set boundaries that said, no, this is my time to be creative in whatever way I'm being creative right now. But this is my time. This is my space. This is what I'm doing. And I have to set boundaries with people who otherwise would lay claim to my energy and my time and my attention. And so I'm wondering from all of you, uh, how important is it to you to set those boundaries? And do you need a separate space to create that you need others to respect? Do you need time alone to create? Do you need groups like ours, like our Vegan Writers of New York City? What are your needs regarding setting boundaries? And how do you fulfill slash enforce those needs and boundaries? Sergio, would you like to go first on this one? Sure. Um, as far as boundaries go, I don't think I have anyone in my life that kind of pushes me or doesn't understand that if I need time to myself, uh, whether it's creative or not, um, that they would kind of, you know, not respect that, Mm -hmm. um, fortunately. But I definitely do, um, am someone who needs time to myself and and a kind of setting um, to, to create. That doesn't mean that I can't write, you know, on a subway or, you know, on a lunch break or whatever the case. But I do like to to find time to kind of um, just get in the right mindset. And also, um, I'm a very social person, but I also uh, can be an introvert, an extroverted introvert, right? So I'm the type of person who needs time to myself to recoup and just to, you know, get energy uh, for the rest of the week or whatever other activities that I'm planning on doing. Um, so, but yeah, I don't think I have anyone that kind of um, imposes on that uh, in my life currently, which is, is fortunate. That's awesome. So do do you find that, like like the group that we've created with the writers, uh, Vegan Writers of New York City, do you find that you work well within that sort of group? Or do you find that you still need uh, a lot of alone time in order to feel like you're truly being the, the best creative self you can be? What are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, so that's the thing with me. I'm, I'm kind of a mixed bag. So um, although I do like alone time, I, I do like to socialize and to, you know, um, yeah, be, uh, work and collaborate with other people. So as far as the writing group, I think it's, it's been a really great um, place for me to, to, to learn and to grow. And, and, to, and it was really awesome to meet all of you people and the other people that um, are in the group that aren't on the, on the series. Yeah. And um yeah, I think it's only been beneficial. So yeah, I, I definitely like having um, both both areas of, of being able to to have my own time to create, and then also to be able to create with others and 
and you know get feedback and stuff on the you know, stuff that I've been working on. Yeah. So I really appreciate the group and, and all of you for that. Oh, that's so sweet. Well, special shout out to Lisa who just joined us at the writers group meeting who said yeah. she'd listen to this episode. So hi, Lisa. Uh, hey, but, shout out, Lisa. You know, upstate New York. It's it's interesting to me what you just said, Sergio, about you know that that it's both, and, and that's something that I think is advice anybody could take. In that, if you are, for example, a writer, uh, if there are writers groups, seek them out. If if you feel like it would help you, right? If you're listening to this and you're going, oh, I feel all isolated. There are lots of writers groups that are meeting online. Depending on where you are, you might have people who are meeting to you know together in person, socially distanced, and all of that. Really think about helping yourself in the way that will help you. So if you, if part of your boundary is you need to open the boundary enough to uh, commit to a writer's group or something like that, then do that. Take care of those needs in a way that feels appropriate to you. And you might find that, like for me, the writer's group is just a, a delight. And I love working with other people. I love giving feedback and getting feedback personally. Some people don't, and that's cool. If if you're much better at writing solo, then do that. But if you feel like you need a group, there's so many writers groups out there, as I said, that are meeting virtually that you can get to, that you can really work through for yourself and really get out of it and put into it something really wonderful. All righty, cool. Megan, what about your thoughts on the question of setting boundaries and separate space to create time alone? What what do you what do you think works for you and what are your thoughts as far as advice for other people who might be going through the same thing? Yeah, so for me, I really used to pride myself on someone who could write anywhere with no boundaries whatsoever. And I actually wrote an entire novel once just um, on the on the metro in D.C. going back and forth to work. But um, huh. that, that novel's not finished even now, and I think there's a reason for that. And that's for, <laughs> for me, I really need um, a separate defined space that I have control over. And one of the hardest things for me during the pandemic has been adjusting to um, a world in which I can't always go to the coffee shop to work because that used to mm. be kind of my defined workspace, especially when I'm working mm-hmm. from home, you know, like my day job space is kind of my apartment. And then I would go out after work to Starbucks or wherever, even or the library and, and work there. So for me, what's been really, really important is making sure that I have some separate space in my apartment, even if that's just rolling out like a different a different kind of placemat and lighting a candle. Sometimes that can just transform the space enough for me that I have that little bit of, of separateness and then it can sort of put me in a different mindset for a different kind of work. And I found that in, in terms of consistency, I'm, I'm so much better at that when I, when I actually take care of myself in that way, when, when I sort of acknowledge that I need that. And I also think it's been really important to me to find community because um, it's so hard to maintain that kind of momentum all alone when you have no one to talk to about it. Um, and for sure. Yeah. For me, that's, that's also been really important for, for such a solitary thing. Like writing is so solitary, no matter, no matter how many writing groups you're in it, it, it keeps having that, that touchstone is really, really important to me in terms of keeping me moving on my projects too. Yeah. And, 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 you know, at the thing about it, for me is it's not just writing, right? You, you you can go to model drawing classes or model painting classes with other artists. You can p- do a pickup band on a Saturday, random Saturday afternoon. I started many years ago, I started a drum circle that ended up becoming like huge in Greenbelt, Maryland, where I used to live. I wanted to get better at drumming. So I asked a friend of mine who happened to play the didgeridoo, hey, John, do you want to go out and into the woods and you didge and I'll play drums because I want to improve my rhythm? And he went, sure. And then he came and I came and a couple other people came. And before we knew it, the whole drum circle was be- getting booked to play weddings. And it was just, it was it was wackadoo, but it was really cool because it was born out of a, a desire for me to become a better musician. But yet I was able to help lots and lots of other people also get access to making music. And, and it wasn't just drumming. After a while, people brought flutes and recorders and guitars and this and that. And that's another way to do it is if there isn't something in your area, start something. I got to tell you, it's so rewarding and wonderful. You'll meet incredible people like Sergio and Alan and Megan, but also you will give yourself and other people an opportunity to make a community where there wasn't one before. And that is what artists do. 
artists make miracles because they make something out of nothing. And that's something that we all need to remember as rediscovering our creativity and our inner artists that we are making miracles. Alan, what are your thoughts about boundaries <laughs> and space to create? I'm just going to keep on moving because otherwise we'll be here until midnight. I so what it. are your thoughts? Well, I don't want to <laughs> be here till midnight because I think I still have yeah, to do my exactly. yoga today. But um, <clears throat> damn, I just remember that. Anyway, boundaries. <laughs> um, uh, my thoughts. Well, definitely, I I need more space, and I it's difficult for me to to be aware of that. When I'm aware of that, then I can sort of start to build it. And what I mean by that is, if I know that I need to do something, like I used to go and write uh, at a local bakery. Uh, for a little bit when I was like work, working on a, a little book I was working on that is not finished also because I just need one more trip back to that bakery mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that gave me the space to be like this is work time but I also f feel like when I go somewhere that I'm just like waiting to get <laughs> to get back or it's like okay how mm. have I done this now I can go home and I don't think of myself as a homebody, but I think I've definitely become one. Um, mm. But recently, the apartment I'm in now has gone through a bunch of like um, reconfigurations. And now we have this table in the middle of our sort of like living room. And, and I set that up. I've been able to just sort of like focus on either the artist's way or doing... Uh, one of the projects I'm working on and just actually work if I can get myself set up but I have a lot of resistance to that and creating that space which I guess is part of that boundary mm. situation is like difficult for me um, mm -hmm. so I, I'm trying to institute more boundaries in my life like set time frames for things and schedules um, and and, and I did that, you know, yesterday I went on my artist date and part of my objective was to, to do my artist date. So I had, I knew I had to set time for that, mm -hmm. which meant when I didn't get moving on laundry in the morning, it meant that I had to do it at night because laundry still had to mm -hmm. get done. So I went, I rode my bike down to the movie theater, rode back when it was just starting to snow and, uh, got home and started doing laundry while it was snowing. It was terrible, but I did it. And knowing that those things all had to get done and that they were a priority for me, I was able to do them. Sometimes I get so lost in all the, uh, all the possible things I could do <laughs> in a given day that I mm -hmm. can't choose any of them. And so it's like limiting those things down to, to the, to what I really need to do is what is a practice I'm currently trying to create and invest in. That's very cool. And so much of this is deciding that it's worth it, you know, that you're worth it, that it's worth it. And I think it's crucial and critical that we do that. But there, there are those what she what Cameron calls little snipers, right? The ones who go, Oh, why are you bothering or Oh, yeah. what, you know, what is there there? And, and it, sometimes it's other people who will tell you that you should be, that dreaded word should be doing something else, but sometimes you do it to yourself. You know, sometimes it's negative self-talk. And and I, I do it to myself. Sure, I get too tired and then I watch TV or read a book instead of writing or making music or other art for myself. Yeah. And and I don't do a lot of self talk about too many of the things that I do, but I do a lot of a lot of I do about my writing. My writing is still full of negative self talk, and I guess I want to put it to all of you: What do you have it? Do you do you do negative self talk? Are you your own sniper? And if so, where do you think it comes from? How did it start? And what are your thoughts about what we can do about it? Uh, let's see who should go first. Sergio. No, Megan, why don't you go first? If you don't mind, because Sergio went first last time. Sure. Sure. So, um, this definitely hit me kind of hard when I was reading this chapter because it made me realize that I am my own worst enemy in so many ways. Mm, like for sure. Like not, it, it's not just the negative self-talk, but that, that is a huge part of it. Um, 
even working through the earlier chapters when we were kind of working through the affirmations and then having to write down, you know, all the things that come up in your mind when you write down that affirmation, even just saying I'm an artist, all the negative thoughts that sort of just appear spontaneously to counteract that. And I'm, and I hadn't realized until I started doing that how much that has affected me and kind of held me back mm, over, for sure, you know, over my entire life, really. And um, mm. I, I think that really that's kind of a process you have to go through if you really want to get past that. You have to figure out, like, where where does that kind of thing come from? I, I think in my case it kind of comes from a, a lot of places and maybe sort of some inherent perfectionism that I have. I mean, I definitely take some of the – so some of the blame there for that but um yeah it's it was actually some really hard, the difficult emotional labor this week just sort of unwinding that and, and realizing that in so many ways like i'm my own i'm my own crazy maker you know i'm my own um yeah my my own worst enemy in, in in so many ways like like the first person to tell me that a project i'm working on or an idea i have is is stupid is always me and you know like mm. that's um like why why do I do that to myself? You know, like why not wait until the thing is at least partially made? You know, why don't I just let, why is it so hard for me to just let things flow? And I think you are so not alone there. I think everybody probably suffers that to some extent. And it's like, it's like hitting yourself in the head with a mallet. I, I, why am I doing this? Why am I hurting myself deliberately? It's keeping me from doing what I set out to do. And yet it is such a, it, it, like you said, it's something we have to unwind. It feels to me like it's a, tang a bunch of tangled jewelry chains and you're picking it apart little by little to see if you can straighten it out. <laughs> and and it's something that is, it looks like a jumbled mess. And what's interesting about it, though, is that if you find that one that, that, un that you undo, all of a sudden through this bizarre undulation, you start seeing that there's an end to it, that there's an end to the... To the constant, oh, this isn't any good, or oh, this idea sucks, or whatever, and just seeing that it's possible, I think, is really helpful. That that it's possible to not have that as a constant barrage inside your own head, which is which is, you know, it, it used to be a constant inside my own head, but it's only in my head now when I try to write, and that's since I do so many other creative things. That's not bad. It's all the, good, in fact. I think that metaphor yes. just loosened my chains a little bit. <laughs> like I felt like <laughs> just hearing it, I was like, oh, there's hope. There's, ooh, I can let go. I can not stress so much. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. I love that. That makes me very happy. <laughs> Yay. I'm, well, I mean, well, you stressed Alan, me out when you mentioned the chains at first. And I was like, oof. And then, then I, was, I was like, okay, okay, okay. You, can, you get that little piece and it starts to come undone. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah, and it works. It it absolutely. I actually love un untangling chains. In fact, people have brought me chains. Ah, oh, these chains got tangled. Is old to undo them, and there's something really therapeutic and meditative about it for me. So I love doing it. So th that metaphor actually holds true for me. I've seen it work many times. Alan, since you since you had that beautiful realization, I'd love it if you would give your thoughts on on this about being your own sniper and what what that process is for you and how you are navigating it well, yeah i mean i'm definitely you know i think i just <laughs> probably said that but i definitely like will shoot myself down and i i have a there's like um this duality of me because like there's part of me that's just like everything i do is brilliant and there's part of me that's like nope <laughs> that's not true and <laughs> what i end up doing and and this is why, for one, I really love the group because I'll, I'll go seek like some outside validation. Like, is this something? Please tell me this is something. And what I was thinking about is like, sometimes I do that until I find someone who tells me it's not worth it. And like, hmm. ah, finally. So sometimes I go, if I can't sniper my own stuff, then I'll like seek out someone who, who will. And that's like, uh, I think just a, not a conscious decision, obviously. I feel mm -hmm. like like I'm ratting on myself. I've seen him do this. Sometimes he'll <laughs> just seek out someone else who will shit on his idea for him. Um, and, and you know, that's it's it's fascinating, isn't it? How we'll do that to to ourselves. It's kind of like shooting all over yourself. Oh, I should do this. Oh, I should do that. Mm -hmm. Wait, I need to find someone who's going to poo poo this idea. <laughs> you know, interesting. 
Interesting. But the other side of that is if I find enough people who support the idea, then it's almost as if I've already done the idea. And then I'm like, well, enough people know that I've had a great idea and I'll move on to something else. And that's frustrating in a different way, obviously. Mm. Yeah. I I said this to my writing students, you know, writers write, professional writers finish. And when I say that in in, in any classroom, inevitably, at least three or four people go, oh, shit. (laughs) You know? (laughs) Because because you have to remember that's that's part of it is finishing is part of the process. Absolutely. Sergio. Yeah, it is. It just is that there's no there's no question. Sergio, what are your thoughts on this? Um, so, yeah, I think um, what Megan said earlier about being my own crazy maker uh, really resonated mm-hmm. with me. Uh, um, I, I don't think I thought about that in that way when I was reading over it. Uh, for this past week's chapter. Um, I've made sure to try my best to cut off toxic people or potential crazy makers, if you will, in the past as I've matured. But I never thought of the notion of being my own crazy maker uh, or just saying it that way, I guess, because I definitely think I'm my own worst enemy. And and I'm trying to get better um, with that. And, and also I relate to a lot of what Alan was saying and, and this feeling of after having an idea of thinking like, oh my God, this is this is amazing. People will love this. But then maybe rereading it or a second later or the next day and thinking, well, this is not good at all or this is mediocre at best. You know, it's almost like there's no in-between sometimes. You can never just think like, oh, this this is good. This has potential. You know, it's one or the other sometimes. It's like such a mm. dichotomy with like the feelings that you can get. Um, so that can be difficult for me, and I, I definitely relate it to what everyone has been saying about it. But I'm trying to get better with not being uh, my own sniper, as you put it. That was that just yeah. was huge for me, Sergio. Sorry, it's all that. I just had a no, no, go for it. A moment where it's like, I what'd you say? Like, oh, like it can get better or something like that. And I realize that like, sometimes I I just will make voice recordings all the time. Like, oh, I'm singing the song. Let me just. <laughs> voice record it mm-hmm. and my always my thought is this is not good but I, I like something about this that I can work on later that I'll be able to work on later and then I haven't been through them in a while and last night I was just starting to like label them and listen to them and I was just like these are absolute garbage <laughs> what are these here for yeah. and you just reminded me that I'm like oh they're not good yet they're just ideas and they need work and that's why they're there, so I can look back at them and see if I want to work on them. But it just was like this little, <laughs> little realization that I've just like stop judging the the um, process and start stop trying to make everything a product is what what it felt like. It was like that's things. Not everything is a product, and not everything's ready for consumption. That's but, that's that's a great takeaway. Um, yeah, that's a great takeaway. There, I'm glad I can help. I really appreciate it. I was like, I was like, whoop. Okay. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And, and it's it's fascinating though. You know, you can like, oh, this is my, this is, this is part of my process. And I, why would I judge a full salad when all I'm doing is holding a bag of lettuce? You know, <laughs> you're not, you're not ready yet. It's not ready. Exactly. You haven't cooked it yet. Whatever. So yeah. Uh, all right. Cool. Uh, have we all talked about this or am I, am I, is my brain fried? I don't remember I anymore. So. Okay, awesome. So, so that we we sort of we sort of covered this next thing, but I would love to to just ask you real quickly. As far as self doubt, do you know any good reasons for self doubt? Do you know any? Can you think of any reasons that are like, yeah, that actually is a time to to doubt yourself? Is there a time when that's an okay thing to have happen? Uh, let's see, uh, Sergio. Why don't you go first this time? Um, Honestly, the first thing that came to my head was a silly example. (laughs) I guess that's what I'll share. So if I'm like going to jump out of a plane and I don't have a parachute and I'm like, (laughs) maybe I'm not going to land. Maybe I'm not going to make it. You know, I think that's probably one of the the, the times where it's all right to have self-doubt. Okay. When you're, when you're endangering (laughs) your life, when I went, when I went skydiving, uh, the guy, it was a tandem jump and he was behind me and he was doing whatever it is he was doing to attach the two of us together. And I just had this thought like, what if he didn't attach us right? 
crap, you know. Oh my God. But I had to sort of trust that it was going to be okay, and and it was, and it was great, and I can't wait to go again. But, but yeah, certainly when it's a danger, when it's potential danger to yourself, it's a perfect time to have self doubt. That's a great point. Um, uh, Megan, what are your thoughts? Any times when self doubt is a good thing? Yeah, I would say once you've gotten all of the like. Uh... All of the big creative ideas down on the paper. I think that there comes a point in your in like the creative process when you've sort of moved through like the beginning stages when you're getting all of the ideas down, and then it's time to sort of bring in the editor, which is kind of like the ultimate self doubter. I think my, one of my mm. problems is that I, I I turn on that that side of my brain too soon, and then I I mm. talk myself out of projects as I'm working on them. But I think there's there's a place for that, and that's you know after you've you're past that beginning stage and you have like all of the good ideas and the bad ideas and the absolutely horrible ideas down already and then that that other side can sort of come in and help you parse them and figure out well what here is worth saving and sifting through and processing into something that could could be something really good and i think yeah i, I would call that healthy healthy self-doubt yeah, and, and that makes sense. I mean, once you're ready for that, then 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 it becomes evaluative and assessing rather than to me self-doubt, you know? So it's almost a different definition at that point. It's not a it's no longer a should I, but it's a what should I do with this now that I have it this way? And is it okay to continue? And maybe it is, maybe it isn't. You might, you know, I've written entire books and then gone, no one will ever see this. And that's okay, you know, <laughs> because because I had to get the bad stuff out in order to let to make room for the good stuff. And that was that was fine, too. Alan, what are your thoughts? Self-doubt. Um, yeah, I mean, I, well, <laughs> I think it's, it sounds like it has a good place. I hate thinking of the editor, Megan, as a villain in this situation. <laughs> But I think it's really reminiscent. I was like, oh, it's the same thing I do. It's just like judging the unfinished product. Mm -hmm. And I was like, we got to reframe the editor as a, a shaper, as a, someone who's like fine tuning the, the thing we already did. I, th I think you're talking about your own editor, right, Megan? Yeah, yeah, that was kind of where I was going with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, oh, yeah, just like, oh, man. I feel like we have this villain villain feeling of the editor, but self doubt as useful as the thing that came to me was like, all right, if you're if you're saying something and you're questioning if it's like valuable or if it's uh, derogatory, it's going to hurt somebody. I think like that's a good place for it, where it's like, all right, have I really thought about the value of what I'm saying here and the impact it's going to have, mm -hmm. and is it the most is it is it is the value of what I'm saying greater than the any potential harm that it may cause right and, and that and and again that's an assessing evaluative thing and i i don't know if so if i look at it as self-doubt mm. as much as self-evaluation you know like should i say this let me evaluate that is it going to be kind is it going to be painful is it going to be hurtful is it going to be malicious if it's going to be malicious chances are don't say it you know keep your mouth shut but this is not to say this is what you were you you would do, Alan. But but is that actually self doubt or is that self evaluation because you're fundamentally a good person? Well, is self doubt uh, just a um, stop on the way to self evaluation or self uh, <laughs> immolation? Self assessment. Yes. Or yeah, self assessment. Well, I yeah. guess. <laughs> or self immolation. Is that what you said? Yeah, I think that's the wrong word, but like, you know, uh, like just self destruction. <laughs> Don't set yourself on fire. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I, and that, and, and if it's just a stop on that journey, uh, as a check in, that's one thing. But I guess to me, is, is your sense of self worth at risk? That's where self doubt starts and self-evaluation stops as far as I'm concerned, right? If your self-worth is at risk, then then that's a problem. Because of if the self-doubt? If your self-worth self is not at risk, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Because if you're, if, you're, if you're evaluating whether or not you should do something or say something or whether or not a piece of art that you've created is something you want to go forth on, it's, you know, thinking it's crap, for example, doesn't necessarily help you or the piece of work unless there is something functional about it. So if it's making you feel like 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 complete crap for having done it, for having made this piece of work or whatever, then then it's self-doubt. If it's self-evaluation, you're looking at it, you're assessing it, you're more objectively seeing whether or not it has merit, 
then that's a different thing. And that's why I that's why I asked the question the way I did, because I personally I'm like, yeah, I, I tend to lead first. I tend to go, you know what, I'm going to jump in both feet and either I'll sink or I'll swim. But I don't I have a very specific relationship with the term rock bottom, for example. Mm-hmm. To me, rock bottom is a beautiful thing because it's for the first time you're standing on solid ground. Right. You're not falling. You're not afraid. You're not anything because you're you're at the baseline. And the same thing with self-doubt. Self-doubt causes all sorts of demons to rise up. But if you finally go, you know what? No, I'm not going to doubt myself. I'm either going to take a stand or I'm going to walk away. That's a much stronger position than one that's full of self-doubt because that's weak and it's not it's not just vulnerable it's weak and that to me is something that I'm not comfortable with as a definition or as something that I would do I tend not to doubt myself just because I if I'm going to make mistakes I'm going to make them be marvelous mistakes they're going to be huge so <laughs> one way or the yeah, other that's Alrighty. awesome because what I'm what it's, make, what it's it. making me think is that like self-doubt is this moment of fear right it's like self-doubt is Mm -hmm. part of fear and it's saying like stop and then you have to think like well why am i stopping and i think what we tend to do is be like stop oh it's we just say like oh it's no good or we lean into like all the negative aspects of it and i think your idea to just go into evaluation or like what is this doubt coming from and this is a lot of like what the work is like where is this coming from why is it doing exactly and in that moment it can be like well what is this about are you afraid someone's going to laugh at you are you afraid that you haven't edited it enough or are you like what is the fear you're afraid like that it sucks you know like what is that and then like that analysis can maybe lead you to a more productive moment being like oh actually i don't like this <laughs> i'm moving on from this project and i can let it go now because it's not good and i'll move on to something that i really have been wanting to do and this has been distracting me from possibly i don't know Absolutely. No, absolutely. I agree. And that's and that's the thing. There are such things as healthy fears. Are you in danger? That's a healthy fear. Mm -hmm. But telling yourself that you're in danger because what you've written might be crap. That's not a healthy fear. Right. Right. There, There. There's the difference. And that's the distinction that I'm making is like, yeah, absolutely. You know, when when you're walking down a dark alley and there's somebody coming up behind you and you're not sure whether or not they mean you harm. Absolutely. It's a perfect time to to have a lot of fear. You know, if you're not sure, then make sure, figure out. But if if what you're doing is making yourself not do something creative because you're afraid someone else will judge it, well, screw them. You know, that's kind of where I am with this. It's like you're telling a story no one else will tell because no one has your experience or ideas. Then, then you know, I, I don't often cuss on this show, but fuck them if they can't take a joke, right? This is, it's an important thing for me. Like we have to be very aware of how often we sabotage ourselves as creatives, as artists, as people. Absolutely. We have to be aware of how often we do that. And the more we can help each other not do that, the better off we all are going to be, I think. So that's that's my thought on it. All righty, cool. So like we let are- us... We have a quota of one F-bomb per episode now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we if you you can F-bomb, you know, you can do that all you want. All I have to do is remember to put the little explicit thing on the on the thing. Um, or the FCC comes after me and shuts down the podcast, which I would prefer not happen. Oh, me too. So, uh, yeah. Th- oh, thanks. So, so, yeah, this is something that is important because of that sense of safety, right? We're talking about this sense of safety and sense of self-acceptance. And one of the things that that Cameron says in the book is creativity flourishes when we have a sense of safety and self-acceptance. And I guess I wonder how those things help us be creative, especially when so many artists are, quote, mad, you know, and many of us think that in order to be great artists, we must be at least a little bit mad. I don't think we do. I think we need to be as healthy as possible so that we have energy and stamina and purpose to make our art. But there is there is this notion that 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 great artists are a little bit mad. So I'm wondering about that for you. Do you think we need to be safe and self-accepting in order to make our best art? Or do you think that that element of the unknown and perhaps even danger is what's more necessary as far as being creative and as far as identifying as an artist? Uh, Sergio, would you like to take that question first? Sure. Um, I don't think that that sense of danger is necessary to create good art, but I think it can. Mm-hmm. I think it can help um, if you take a risk or 
do something different out of the norm, um, as uh, you know, as long as you're being safe, then I think that can definitely help with your with your uh, uh, creativeness. But I, I, I do I do feel like that over time this idea of all the best artists are a little mad. I feel like that's kind of a romanticized kind of notion, right? That mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Has happened, and and yeah, I disagree with that as well. I don't I don't think that that's that's necessary. Awesome. And Alan, what are your thoughts? Well, you just made me think of somewhere in here. She says, <laughs> "You're we're trying to work towards going sane, and going sane can feel like going crazy." Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep, that's exactly the quote, and that's exactly I have that in in this in this thing to talk about. But yes, please talk about it. <laughs> well, I, I just like uh, I. It just blew my mind. I was like, well, how how do you know which one, one you're doing? <laughs> and then you give it a moment. Because um, it feels like you're sort of shifting the world. And I think, like, we don't think artists necessarily have to be mad, but I don't think that um, being mad prevents you or it makes you, you sh- like, uh, well, obviously mad artists exist, right? And sure. So <laughs> we all accept it, I think. Um, so what my what I'm trying to say here is, is that finding that sense of safety is a place is is good, obviously for us because we'll be able to create, right? And so we're like, if you're a locked artist, you want safety. If you're a mad artist and you're just creating. That's like, it's, it seems to be like necessary art. Mm-hmm. Um, like, it's just like <laughs> you've tapped into the flow and that's all your, that's like where you're getting all your energy from. So you're just recycling it back out, which can be amazing, but it sounds exhausting. And I think finding that balance of like, how do I be an artist that lives in the world and maintains the relationships with my family or friends or my sense of the world then i think you do have to create those spaces and and make yourself sane enough to understand did i just mute myself sorry about that nope you didn't oh good then i'm glad i didn't (laughs) i retract my apology (laughs) did i answer the question or i just go all over the place no, no, no. I think I think you did, and I think it's important to think about in those terms. You know, it's it's perfectly okay to start thinking and not know whether or not you're crazy or sane, as long as you're on a path to understanding yourself better. You know, there are there are some people out there who are insane, and that and and there are lots of creative people are insane, but there are also lots of creative people who are not insane, and that is perfectly fine. And I think one of the things that's that's sort of my soapboxes is that you can you can be perfectly happy and still make incredibly amazing and provocative and incredible art so i don't think you need to be certifiably part of the dsm5 at all you know you can absolutely be completely happy and well adjusted and still make incredible art that moves people and inspires people and and does whatever so that's my thought on that. Yeah, you don't All have right, to be a uh, drunk or a drug addict or um, a maniacal maniac. You can do good art and be happy. And I think that's important to remind people because there is this yeah. there's this underlying thing that she also addresses early on about like this fear that you're going to be a crazy person or <laughs> or whatever other casualties may fall you if you try to become an artist. Yeah, I forget who it is who has that quote that says, be orderly in your uh, life so you can be uh, something, something like amazing in your art or something like that. And uh, I absolutely agree with that. All righty. Sergio, what are your thoughts on that question of, I don't even forget even the question, hang on. Uh, Self-acceptance and sense of safety. Um, I think I went over how I felt about that. Oh, did oh, yeah. you? Okay, I'm sorry. Megan, 
Yeah, sorry. I'm starting to get a little lost about who because I, I keep wanting to have everybody take turns going first. And I, I'm getting a little lost as far as who's gone and who hasn't. So, Megan, sorry about that. Please give me <laughs> your thoughts. Apologize. No worries. No worries. I, I feel like the um, the kind of myth of this of the crazy artist is sort of a really romantic idea that for me really doesn't work. It's it's never worked. I think um, mm-hmm. as someone who has a lot of anxiety in, in my real life, the only way I can really create consistently and create good work that I feel good about is to make my my life as um, really as, as safe as possible. You know, I have to create my little zones of creativity. I have to have things happen on a really specific schedule. I have to have um, blocks of time in the day when I'm doing my creative work. Like I have to have boundaries and boxes around everything that I'm doing. Like it, it has, really has to be as sane as possible for me or, or I really just can't function. And I think I'm not the only writer artist who, who works that way. I think um, for a lot of people that, that idea that you sort of have to be a little bit crazy to really create good art can really hold you back because, um, you know, I think in some cases it can even stop you sometimes from getting help if you have, you know, a mental health issue and you're worried that it will affect your creativity, which she also touches on, you know, earlier in the book. And I was, I was thinking about that kind of also in the context of, um, my anxiety too and like how much you know creating those safe spaces for my art really does sort of free me from um that extra level of anxiety that can sometimes hold me back Mm -hmm. from really really going there in my work absolutely and it led like it like is it Camus who said it I forget you know if you're orderly in your life you can be wild in your art and there is something really powerful to me about that notion and that idea so yeah absolutely now having said that i want to turn turn the tables on all of us a little bit and talk about other people (laughs) doubting us or being toxic what she says is that a lot of times the most toxic people to be around are other artists who are still blocked who will critique you who might make you feel like crap about what you've done what are your thoughts on that do you think that's true and how if it is true, how can we navigate and negotiate those relationships? Some of them you might want to leave. Some of them you want to keep or you can't lose because they're like family members or whatever. How do you navigate those people in your life who are your inner critic personified? What are your thoughts? Uh, Megan, why don't you go first this time? Yeah, so I I think that... um... When we have people like that in our in our life, the the best thing, I think the the way I've I've dealt with it most effectively is to just make boundaries really clear around them. Like especially if it's a relationship that I that I can't leave or that I don't want to leave. It's it's knowing like when it's safe to share with this person and when it's when it's not safe. And mm-hmm. sometimes you have to learn that the hard way. But um, for me, it is really important to make sure that I know what the boundary is, even if I don't tell, even if I don't explain that to the other person, you know, maybe I just won't talk about this project with them. Or maybe mm-hmm. I, I just, you know, make sure that when I'm working on my on my creative work or whatever, it's it's not like not, nothing I'm working on is really where they where they can see it, you know, like mm-hmm. if. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think. That was something I, I ran into a lot when I was living in DC, right? Where I had a lot of friends who a lot of them were really creative, but a lot of them were were really blocked, and they were really almost kind of like uh, upset when I was really working on trying to move past that and taking on more bigger creative projects. And I and I kind of learned that I had to function that way. You know, a lot of these people I really cared about, and I didn't want to just cut them out of my life, but I I did sort of have to make that creative part more mine and less less something that we really talked about as a community. And that makes a lot of sense to me. I think that there's that that there are choices to be made and and you can be very practical about it. You know what? This person is just not someone I can talk about this with and that's okay. And then the key is to not feel bad when they want to talk to you about it and you're like, "Actually, let's talk about the weather and that's going to be fine." So, because because some people, I guess to me, haven't earned the right to get to get to those vulnerable parts of me. And that's okay too, especially if I'm in the beginning phases of whatever project it is. Alan, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm trying to think of 
Well, my thought, my, <laughs> I was reading the crazy maker aspect of this, and I thought, oh shit, I'm the crazy maker. <laughs> I'm the one who messes with everyone's stuff. And, I, you know, I probably have spent a lot of time as a blocked artist uh, trying to find my way back here. And that's why I'm doing this now, you know, to put me back on course. And mm. and I, I think, like, it can be tough. Like, I definitely have people who have, I guess, not loved my ideas. But what I generally find is is most frustrating to me is when they don't understand the idea, and then mm. they just sort of, and then it's just kind of like a nonplussed attitude. And it's like I don't, I don't, I don't know what you're doing here or something. And I'm just like, oh, either I need to explain this better, or or it's a garbage idea. And sometimes I just need to explain it better, and other times I, I. I can't, <laughs> and so <laughs> and that's okay. I'm stuck there, but yeah, you definitely have to watch out for those people. I think I was in, in, embedded with them. There were like a lot of them in my life for a while, and now I don't have them. It's a different time, and I feel a little more sane, I guess. But also, I'm missing the chaos because I like that stuff. And chaos can have its place as long to me, as long as it's controlled chaos, like as long as you know when to stop. Yeah. And that's that's important. Uh, OK. And again, I'm lost because I was paying too much attention to what you were saying to remember whether or not Megan and Sergio, you've talked about this. Help. Yep. We talked about it. <laughs> OK, good. So let's now because honestly, my brain is so full of the ideas that I'm forgetting oh, where I am. I wanted to say um, sorry. Mm hmm. One other thing, because I was thinking about this vice versa or the opposite side of that versus people who are negative. And there's definitely been people in my life. I had a friend in college. Uh, her name was Kara. And she watched me start a theater company and perform, you know, finish college and start a theater company. And at the time, I was just kind of like, oh, I got to do this. this. is what I'm doing. And it's no big deal. <laughs> And I was like, I need mm -hmm. to, I need to make, a, I make my my life a success now. Now that I've started a theater company, I've done these plays. Um, and then she would be like, "You're doing so much." I think she had moved to Seattle at the time. She was like, "You've done all of this," and she had to like sort of point me back to look at what I had done. And once I could like look back in the instead of like in the rear view, but look back and fully turn around and look at it, I was like, "Oh right, I was doing stuff," and I was. <laughs> actively living my life in in the field i wanted to live it and you're right i i was successful and i think like i needed more of those people in my life and i think that's part of it isn't it it's like there's a there's a there might be a plethora of of toxic people or crazy makers as cameron calls them and there might not be as many cheerleaders or or supporters yeah. but the the key becomes finding the people who are, you know, whose role may not just be as your supporter, as a collaborator, as as a cheerleader, but also as someone who's there going, yay, good on you, you know, keep going. And there's something really positive about that, as opposed to someone who goes, oh, that's what you're doing. Oh, <laughs> OK, fine. You know, and, and that's a different that's a different story. And when we're in this place of vulnerability there's a there's a shift I think that takes place that that goes from it's easier not to create to it's easier to create. You know, that's one of the things that she that Cameron talks about in all of this is that it becomes easier in many ways to to write than not to write, to sing than not to sing, mm -hmm. to to audition than not to audition because you accept about yourself that you are this person. Like you said Megan early on tonight, that you are the person who is a writer, that you are the person who does work on this part of your art slash craft and not working on it becomes something that's that, that makes you, that's an agitative uh, material as opposed to working on it becoming something that's anxiety provoking. So there's something to be said for that. And I personally love that. And I love the, the notion 
that the process, not the product, is the focus. And Alan, you mentioned that earlier. It's so important to me to know that when I'm in the process of creation, I don't think of it as doing, you know, the great creator's work or whatever. That's that's not where I go with it. But being in the process of creating is this wonderful, miraculous thing that I really appreciate. What are your thoughts on that as far as being easier to write than not write or sing than not sing and the process versus the product? Uh, Sergio, would you like to go first on this? Sure. Um, I think... It's really important to to think about the process or focusing on the process versus the product. And for me, that really comes down to to being present and and trying to be more present and and pay attention to what you're doing in the moment, which was a big focus on this week's chapter. I'm not sure if I'm getting ahead of myself, if that's all right to talk about. It's all right to talk about anything. Awesome. Um, So I think that's for me, like focusing on the process as opposed to the present really comes down. I mean, excuse me, as opposed to the product really comes down to being uh, present. It's a lot of alliteration going on there. Um, Mm -hmm. And for me, I really, I really like that she focused on, on paying attention to, to yourself and how important that can be. Mm -hmm. And there's a few things she said that really stuck out to me. And one of them was um, in times of pain, when the future is too terrifying to contemplate and the past is too painful to remember, I have learned to pay attention to right now. And she also says, in, in, in regards to finding it difficult to be present, that we spin our wheels and indulge in daydreams of could have, would have, and should have. And that's something that I just do all the time. I, I, I daydream a lot. I'm a Pisces. We kind of meant to do that. I don't know if people you know, <laughs> believe in that sort of stuff. but. Um, that can be real difficult. And I think when Alan said that and, and how you reiterate about just focusing on the process versus the product, how important that is. And, and really that means that not, I'm getting redundant now, but just be present and, and appreciate what you're doing and that you're actually doing something. Um, even if it's just, you know, something that's not necessarily creative, you know, it can be taking out the laundry and stuff, but I think just allowing yourself to be more present will help with your creativity uh, in the long run. And I'm sorry, maybe I was rambling a bit. I don't know if that answered. No, that's good. No, it's good. And, and yeah, and and we were we were going to get to attention, so you just brought it up a little bit early. That's all. Uh, and Megan, what are your thoughts on that part of it? If you want to talk about the attention part too, that's great. If not. The, the the question that I'm asking about being easier to write than not to write or sing than not to sing because you're involved in the process and what it does for you as uh, an artist. Yeah, I think for me, when I have those boundaries set up and when they're functioning for me, that's when it really becomes easier to create things than, than to not create things. And also, mm-hmm. um, I really it resonated with me what Sergio was talking about because I really think that attention for me kind of dovetails right into that. When I'm really able to turn in tune into the world around me and notice those little things that sort of bring that that sense of delight that um julia cameron was talking about in the in this chapter when, when i can actually pay attention to that stuff that's when it's so much easier for me to tune out all of that background noise of like the the me being a crazy maker you know like all, all of that sort of falls away and i can just really focus on the the stuff i want to be making and and how specifically i want to be working so so to me it really does tie in and um it's been it's definitely been important to me figuring out my process cool that may i mean it makes a lot of sense and it all that's the thing though it all ties in to itself you know when you have the boundary set up crazy makers won't bother you as much and we're going to talk about crazy makers in a second but you know when the toxic people we'll call them that for now they, they they can't get in uh, because you have boundaries until you're willing to open the door, unless you're willing to open the door. And setting that up starts feeling weird to us because we feel guilty that we aren't, or at least I do. If, if I don't give in to the crazy maker, for example, if I don't give in to the toxic person when they want my time and energy, I feel guilty. And that's a problem for a lot of people that there's this innate guilt of oh this person needs me so therefore 
but if you are doing what you do, Megan, and which which is you know set those boundaries, be present, and and able to pay attention to what's in front of you, you don't get derailed, and that is a beautiful thing. And congratulations on that. Ah, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, Alan, did you talk about this already or no? No, I have. I haven't talked about. Okay. It. Yeah. Sorry. Y'all are gonna have to just remind me because my brain is I'm too full of ideas and not full not not full enough of of paying attention to what's actually happening in front of me. Oh, no. All right, Alan. That's funny that that's the problem you're having right now. I know. <laughs> lots of being filled with lots of ideas is also a good problem, right? Some would say. Yeah, it's a it's a positive problem. No, it's not that I'm filled with ideas as far as like, oh, I'm gonna go write this book. It's more like I'm filled with ideas as you're speaking to talk about, to respond, to, you know, and then I forget who said what because I'm so present in, in what's going on. But anyway, Alan, thoughts. Well, we appreciate you being present. <laughs> um, and I'm also That's trying to be present. Um, I just he had this image of me circling my desk and like there's a gravitational pull towards it. I'm sort of waiting for that moment to feel mm. like I. it's more fun to write. Like I, or not, it's not even a desk. It's just like the, t the table in the middle of the room. And um, when I get there, yeah, it's better to write than just stare at the screen, I think. Um for sure. But, uh, or do anything else because it, it, then I can't write. But, um, oh, what? I just think I lost my train of thought. What I was thinking was, um, oh my God, better to write than not write. Oh, oh, I wanted to mention this, right? So, I, th this interesting thing happened to me in my morning pages, and, and on two different days, two different things happened. And the, the one reason I want to mention this now is because one of the things was at the end of my three pages, there was a voice that was just like, write a little more, <laughs> just keep writing a little huh. bit. And I was like, why? And I was just like, just keep I literally wrote like just half a page more, but I was like, all right, that's good. But I was like, what is it you want me to write more? Why is this <laughs> happening? What did, I did my three pages. I should be free from this. <laughs> And then the other interesting thing happened, which I think that was today, that might happen today. And then a couple of days ago, at the I was like on my last page, and then I just started sort of <laughs> writing as my dad, and oh, wow. who passed away like about nine, eight or nine years ago, nine years ago I think. Wow. And I just started sort of writing from his voice, and I. It was like I knew I was in control of the pen and I knew that I was writing it, but I also felt like he was there. And if anything, I was just like editing his message. Um, wow. But it was just it's like, amazing. what's that? That's amazing. Uh, if not, not if you know my dad, this is exactly the type of thing he would do. Just take it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, it, it was cool. And I, <laughs> He'd just come back from the dead and take over your pen. Oh, no. It's just, that's the kind of guy he is. I think he told me to like right. send love to my family and, and just let me know he loved me or something like that. I should see if I can read that's it. That's lovely. But that was another thing that's just like, I was like, what is this? And I'm like, I'm just going to indulge this, whether it be fantasy or real. I'll just like, let it play out however it plays out and it's kind of like a sweet moment for me but that was my little discovery in the in the morning pages and then, and then today made me feel like okay maybe it's time to do a lot more writing than i've been doing so maybe i'm getting yeah there. write just a little bit more that's awesome good for you and that's i you know according to cameron that's exactly what she's talking about is that that transformation from I would rather I would rather not be writing to I would rather be writing yeah. or I would rather not be singing to I would rather be singing or whatever it is. That's awesome. Uh, so but let's talk about the other part, the other side of that coin. When when the people in your life aren't supportive, aren't showing up in your writing and going, hey, you can write more. What about those crazy makers? And what she she defines them as charismatics. There are people in your life who you know long on problems short on solutions they they have this 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 incredible sense of when you're just starting to work on something and they're they're asking for a favor or they need you to listen to their problems or they need a ride to the airport but they have this innate sense of calling right when you're like i'm working this is great i'm i'm this thing and i'm really excited about 
you know, and then the text comes through and I can't believe that Josh left me. And all of a sudden you're like, no. So so those are the people they get in. They get in the way of you making your art is the best way of saying it. And in the book, she sounds pretty bitter about them like she's had more than her fair share uh because they do the, the whole point of her definition of crazy makers is they'll take a lot of your time while promising it's only going to take a minute they're going to need for you to do things for them but they're always too busy to do stuff for you you know and nothing that ever goes wrong is their fault is is what she says and they don't have any desire to pay attention to your needs or your deadlines they just want their whatever they're going through to be the thing you focus on. And so I'm wondering what your thought of that is. Do you have any crazy makers? And if so, what are some strategies and techniques to keep them from derailing you? Uh, Megan, why don't you go first on this one? Yeah, this section really made me laugh because she just sounds so angry throughout the whole thing. <laughs> she does. Like, like, like I, I just can sense that she's had so many of these people in her life. I think, um, I've actually been really lucky in that I I really am mostly my own crazy maker. I don't have a whole lot of people in my life who have um, you know actively worked against me in terms of um, accomplishing cre creative things. But I have mm -hmm. found that when that sort of thing does come up with other people, the best thing I can possibly do is just make sure that I know in my own mind, um, well, that I have my priorities clear and that and that I know how to draw boundaries with that person. And that's. That's not always as easy as just saying, okay, here's the boundary. But I think <laughs> that it's crucial really to, you know, getting through those situations and figuring out how to still accomplish stuff despite this other person interfering. I have to know where, where the line is and I need to know really exactly how much time I'm willing to devote to this person. You know, how important is this relationship even, you know, like mm -hmm. how much mm -hmm. of my time is worth digging into their, their whatever quagmire they, they've sort of created, you know, like sometimes if it's someone I really care about a lot, you know, that that's, that can, can be some time, you know, I, I might devote to that. But if it's, you know, not a situation like that, then I think it's totally fine to, you know, back away as much as possible and just try to reclaim more of that space for yourself. And I actually think that's maybe what the artist dates are kind of about. It's, it's sort of teaching you to make time for, for you, to create that space for you, no matter how much other people try to claim that time and take it away from you. There's this time that's just for you and your creativity to mm -hmm. to have that input space. And that, that I think is really important. Cool. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, Alan, what are your thoughts? Listen, my dog will just sleep soundly when I'm just not doing anything sitting there. And the minute I get up to <laughs> Your do dog it, is your crazy maker. What's that? <laughs> I said your dog is your crazy maker. She, she is kind of a little bit right now. I hate to talk mean about her because she's the best. But whenever I get up to sort of start to work, that's when she wants to play. She's like, okay. She's like, now, now we're doing stuff. And I'm like, no, not us. Me now I'm doing I'm okay, let me throw you the ball for a little bit. Let's oh you need to go for a walk, let's do this. So right now she she definitely serves that purpose and I think she's a good enough dog that if I ignore her she'll go figure out something else to do for a little while and she she does wait patiently when I do that. But mm -hmm. there is this feeling of like some sort of codependency in this situation, right? Where like it is maybe two locked artists or something that, that are struggling and this feeling that one of them is going to start creating is, is feels like they're leaving. feels like they're going to go mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. and, and there's a fear. I think I'm being very sweet to the crazy maker because I also feel like I, I've lived that part, but like, there's this moment of like, Oh, you, you're, you want to go do other stuff because I'm not good enough. I don't fulfill you. And that's probably an unhealthy relationship, but that seems what the crazy maker doesn't seem like a healthy relationship. So, um, I think there is probably an element of that and mm -hmm. it's, it's both a practice to support yourself and to support others. I think, because I think as a, as an artist, you can look at other people's success and think like, Oh, that threatens me or that means I can't do it or, or I should be that person or whatever it is. And I think finding ways to lift others up, and I think you're really good at this as old as an artist, 
to bring other artists in and, and wow thank you be i mean yeah <laughs> definitely and just like bring them into a, a space of creativity and root for them is 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 not common it's it's something i always strove to do is when i was directing or coaching and stuff like that i wanted to bring people up and, and lift them up and find and and move more people up into the ranks of being comfortable with themselves and, and performing but i also know that i would i felt you know jealousy and bitterness towards other people and i probably haven't supported people in the ways that I could have by, you know, just seeing shows or something like that. Uh, or nice notes. I don't know. There's <laughs> ways to do it. And I think I, I could have done that more and it might have been good for me to just root for people instead of um, feeling that that feeling that negative space of, of want, of lack that, that I was living in at that moment. That's incredibly self-aware of you. And thank you for your kind words, but it really that's that's very self-aware because it is um listening to you I'm like, yeah, there's there is this time in everybody's life when you see people who are who even, you know, if they start sort of after you, but then they they move <laughs> past you and you're going, "Wait, I've been doing this longer. No. What's up?" And and there's you know, but at the same time, it's like the way I've the way I've started looking at it as I've gotten older is well, if they can do it, I can do it. You know, that's 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 a that's sort of a it's possible kind of situation in my head nowadays. It didn't always, it wasn't always like that, but that's where I go with it now. It's like they can do it. That's awesome. That means it's possible. That means that they're that I'm not spitting in the wind. Yeah. I, there there is a method to this, and there's something really powerful about that. I think. Uh, Sergio, why don't you go next on this? Sure. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you, Alan, for, for sharing that, that side of perspective. Um, oh, of course. It sounded like it was coming from a, a vulnerable area, so I really appreciate you sharing that. Whoops. It was really cool of you. And also, I'd never, never thought I'd say this, but I'm a bit jealous of your crazy maker, as in, as in the puppy. That sounds adorable. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. come by come visit anytime yeah maybe uh when you, when you take her for a walk that that could be cool <laughs> um uh as far as crazy makers go i feel like reciprocity is a really really important thing for me one of the most important things for me and so i think someone's effort or energy that they're giving you is, is, the, is the kind of energy i would return so as i've gotten older I've been able to cut out toxic or negative or unreliable people from my life um, or potential crazy makers, as I mentioned before. So fortunately, um, I don't have that issue now. Um, in fact, it's kind of the opposite. I'm surrounded by such wonderful people and artists like yourself, um, like this group, and I have uh, a few friends who are creative that I collaborate with, uh, a few close friends and I created a YouTube channel a few months back called uh, The Multiverse Odyssey. Sorry for the shameless plug, but we're on YouTube. And um, yeah, we've been collaborating and I just um, am very grateful, I think at the moment to say that um, I, I'm not dealing with any, any crazy makers in my life. Well, that's awesome good for you and uh if you get me the link i'll put the link to your youtube channel in the show notes page uh that yeah it's great and and it's uh you've gotten to a place however you've done it you've gotten to a place where you don't have any crazy makers amazing other than, <laughs> other than myself that is well and, and you know what and that's something you can work on right that's that's the point is that that's not something you have to set boundaries on with other people mm -hmm. It's something that you can that you can work on for yourself and and with you know with our support and we and that's one of the reasons we're doing this whole thing is to to go through the process together and to support each other as we do. Megan, what are your thoughts? Um, I actually think I covered this one already, didn't I? Oh, maybe you did. <laughs> <laughs> My brain. All right, cool. Let's move on. 
Uh, yeah, I see. This is why. This is why I uh, I should never be up this late. This this part of my problem. This is way oh. past my bedtime. Uh, okay. So so yeah. I mean, and the thing about crazy makers, I think, is that they the 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 idea, the notion of crazy makers keeps coming up later in the book, and a lot of it is that you doubt when you have a crazy maker in your life you start you start doubting whether or not their problems are more important than your problems right so you're like wait a minute i was working on this thing but this person is just texting me and they're having all this drama and do i ignore them or do i tell them i can talk to them later so that i can keep focusing on what i'm doing or do I stop what I'm doing, stop my art, stop my creativity to focus on them? And that is the key thing that I think has to, uh, if you've got a crazy maker in your life who does impact you this way, that's a key thing you have to look at, is how often do you stop what you're doing in order to focus on their drama, right? I said this to, uh, I put it up on Facebook or wherever, Instagram years ago now, and basically it's a, it's a drama-free zone. Like, I only want my drama in books, movies, TV shows, and theater, not in my life. So if you've got drama to bring me, it somebody's head better be on fire. That's the kind of drama that, you know, I I honestly don't want people to be like, oh, my life sucks and you have to help fix me. I spent many years doing that for people. And now I don't do that anymore unless you pay me a lot of money. So only drama on stage or in movies, TV shows, or in books. And people got mad at me for it. And this comes up in later chapters in the book, but I had a lot of people call me a selfish bitch (laughs) because I refused to give up what I was doing in order to participate and fix their drama. And if you, if you have a crazy maker in your life, I'm, I'm here to tell you, you know, I'm, I'm with, you know, can I get an amen? Um, This is something that you need to be aware of is that if people start calling you selfish, you are on the right track bear that in mind no seriously it becomes important later on because this process is all about setting up those boundaries and often if you don't have any boundaries people who are used to you not having boundaries and therefore being there for them start thinking you are being really selfish when you set up those boundaries be prepared for that so that you understand that that is what's happening when it happens And that's one of the things is that when those good things start happening, we start getting skeptical about it. We start saying, oh, maybe I am a crazy, selfish bitch. No, you're just taking care of yourself, right? So we as artists, as recovering artists or discovering artists, however you want to look at it, have to start looking at when those good things start happening because we're taking these actions and then allow the skepticism to fade away so that what, what Cameron calls synchronicity can work in our lives. And I would love to hear your thoughts about about this notion because it it dovetails beautifully into what Sergio was saying earlier about attention, that, that to be there, to allow ourselves to be present and to pay attention to what is happening in front of us, we have to leave skepticism at the door. What are your thoughts on that? In fact, Sergio, if you don't mind talking about that first, that would be great. Um, yeah, I think you know, just going off of what I said earlier, um, I think being present and, and paying attention to your surroundings and yourself is really important. Um, another quote that was in there was by the poet William Meredith, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And it said that um, William Meredith has observed that the worst that can be said of a man or person is that he or they did not pay attention. And for me, um, as I mentioned in previous episodes, mindfulness is is very important to me. Mm -hmm. And I know like myself, some can suffer from dwelling on the past or worrying too much on the future. So I like that she emphasizes enjoying your presence in the present. And for me, yeah, it comes down to just trying to be mindful. And I think that's and a very important thing for everyone, not just creatively, but just in general. Absolutely. That's why I have a, a, a day of the podcast devoted to mindfulness. Every Friday, I talk about different ways to be mindful and different techniques to be mindful because that's all part of being aware and being present. And she calls it paying attention. You're calling it being mindful. But it's that that presence 
And like I said, uh, I don't remember if I said this in last week's episode or if I said this on another episode when I was talking about Pema Chodron's quote, which is the only definition of hopelessness that I can get behind, which is hopelessness is the release of all hope for an alternative to the present moment. And I love that because that means that you're not going, what if? You're not going, why am I not getting this? Why did someone else get it? All you are is being present where you are. And that is really singular and a really beautiful experience, which I admit doesn't happen often to me, but it's something that is a practice that I do every day. And I try to remind myself of when I meditate, when I do yoga, etc. So if you are looking for a good definition of being present, that's one to look at, uh, one of Pema Chodron's phenomenal quotes. All righty, cool. Uh, Alan, why don't you tackle this next if you'd like? I got a little lost. Are we talking about hopelessness? No. No, we're talking about atten- paying attention and being present <laughs> oh, yeah. and allowing skepticism to fall away because when you're present, you can actually see the synchronicity begin to work in your life, kind of like writing in your father's voice, kind of like you know, that voice telling you to write a little bit more, those things starting to happen, there's a tendency to go, oh, what is this? And be skeptical about it instead of embracing it and riding the ride and seeing where it takes you. Oh, right. Well, I mean, it feels like what she's doing, and I think, I don't know if you said something like this, but she's just, there's a, we're learning different lessons that are coming together, right? So like set up boundaries, pay attention. And I think you're right to keep nailing on this, Sergio, because... I feel like what that's what the artist date is about is paying attention. Be by yourself and just pay attention. And I feel like mm-hmm. what we do as artists is we look and we see something a certain way and then we share that vision of something, right? And that's why it's so unique to us. This is how we see these things. And this is my specific view of it. And there's a resonation in there because we all have similar views, but maybe we're seeing it like slightly, slightly askew a degree or two off from where we've seen it before. And now we're going, Oh, oh I haven't seen it like that before. This is amazing. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's really cool. And I think once you start really looking in and looking at stuff rather than letting the brain be like, what are you doing? You're, that skepticism does fall away, right? Or like you're tuning, you're tuning in. And so you can tune out that skepticism almost tune in and tune out. I don't know. That's the, the short <laughs> word. That makes a lot of sense. All righty. Cool. Megan. Yeah. So this section of the book I thought was just really, really beautiful. The way she wrote about her grandmother's letters and everything and how she would, she realized eventually that all the little details that she thought were kind of extraneous at first were really how her grandmother was sort of processing all of these much bigger traumas going on in her life and how she was finding, if not happiness, like a, a certain kind of delight in, in the world around her. And I think that as creative people, it's so important to have the space in your in your brain to sort of notice those little things because that's where the specificity of, of you as an artist comes out and the things you specifically notice. And that's something that only you can do, you know, noticing things exactly the way you do and, and talking about them and thinking about them and then translating them in, in is something that only you can do in your in your voice. And to me that was just really, really profound because I think it that's something that hasn't always come naturally to me noticing taking the time and the space to notice those things and I think when I do get into that mold that is kind of when a lot of that skepticism can can fade away a little bit and there's more room for me to focus on the things I really want to be doing and um yeah I I I love that and I love her her that though that section about her grandmother and how yeah she's processing grief but it's also she's paying such incredible attention to the little things but those little things give her such reward and you know in in the book she has a a Rilke quote and that is the reward for attention is always healing ultimately it's the pain that we are all unutterably alone and there that sentence is both incredibly uplifting and also full of desolation (laughs) and and yet being present in the moment allows you to heal that feeling at least a little bit according according to her and 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 it's possible according to the rest of us all righty okay so tummy 
importance of paying attention is being aware right now. That's what mindfulness is all about. That's what, what everything is all about as far as attention and awareness and, and mindfulness. It's, it's, it's being here, being in the now. There's a, there's a book called The Way of the Peaceful Warrior by Dan Millman, and long and arduous explanation for what it is, but this young man uh, has a, a wise teacher, and the teacher asks him, where are you? And the answer is here. And he says, what time is it? And he answers now. And then he says, what are you? And the answer is this moment. And when I read that, it just blew me away because yes, that's the key right there. It's being present right here, right now, wherever you are is here. What time is it now? What are you? I'm this moment. And I love that notion and have kept it with me since I first read the book 30 years ago or so. So there's a lot to this. That's and amazing. It's I would love... really grounding to think that what? way. Just to like, just think that I'm in this moment and then say, like, okay, here I am. Yeah. That's it. And it's, it's, I highly recommend The Way of the Peaceful Warrior to anyone and everyone. It's a, it's a powerful book. Uh, all right. So, so let's talk tasks, the rules of the road. Would we like to read those or is it okay to, to skip the rules of the road? What are your thoughts? We can skip them, I think, and like, people can read those on their own, but unless you want yeah. to. Okay. No, no, no. It's fine. So in there, she talks about in order to be an artist, I must. And she goes through what she believes are the rules of the road to be an artist. Uh, feel free to add your own. That's one of the things that having gone through the book, this is my third time going through the book. I've added things. I've marked things out. I've gone. Yeah, this doesn't feel right for me. It is OK. If something doesn't feel right for you, cross it out. Add something that does bear that in mind. So let's talk about the tasks. Now, uh, there's a there's a. Read the basic principles to yourself every day. That was one of the tasks. Did anybody do that? Um, so that was actually something I wanted to, to bring up or to ask. That that task didn't really have much effect on me um, when I would read it. Did anyone else? How did everyone else feel about reading the basic principles every day? I didn't <laughs> read all of them. I read the ones, like, remember how we talked about which ones resonated for us? I asterisked the ones that resonated for me, and I only read those. Mm, I should have so, <laughs> so that's what I did. I kind of went, yeah, the, the other ones don't speak to me. I don't need them. I will focus on the ones that spoke to me. And so that's what I did. And I like them because they speak to me, because it reminds me. It's kind of like, the the what are you this moment? Where are you here? You know, all of that is something that works for me and i am a i'm a practitioner of keep the best lose the rest so that's what i did i did exactly the same thing i um just kind of transcribed and translated a little bit the my, my favorites into my own words a little bit and those are the ones that i repeated every day i, I did not do all of them and yeah Alan? i read uh, i read them like once or twice honestly and <laughs> i liked reading them I just got to the book late and I was like, oh man, I forgot that part. And uh, as soon as I saw it, I was like, oops, that's not something I did. And I'm trying to let myself, you know, not have to do everything and not be, uh, I think I've said this before, but not, I'm really trying to make a conscious effort not to judge my process through this and how I'm doing it and just let myself do what I can and get back into it as much as I can when I can. Yeah, that make, it makes, a, makes a lot of sense. But, Sergio, how do you feel about those answers? Um, yeah, my biggest takeaway is that I'm just going to read the ones that really stuck out to me, the two or three that, <laughs> yeah. that really resonated with me. I think in the future, if I continue doing that, it are the ones that i And I like how Megan kind of just rephrased it her own way so she can just say it to herself. I think that's a good idea as well. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. For the next task, the five major activities uh, what was interesting to me about this was like, yeah, I went through that and I and I saw that I've been spending an awful lot of time on the podcast because there are a lot of things to have to do for the podcast. And then I've spent I spent a fair number of hours this week with a bunch of crazy makers and uh, and I have this I have I have the words I will fix your problems tattooed in an invisible ink on my <laughs> forehead. 
And so I get random emails from people who don't know me who say things like, hey, uh, I know that you're a writer and I need the name of a good editor for memoirs. Can you give me names? And I'm like, I don't even know you. Who are you? Hello? <laughs> but that's that sort of that happens to me and it happens to me a lot. So a lot of what the, that task was, I spent a fair amount of time answering other people's questions and uh, and I'm really realizing that's nice of me, but it's not required of me. And so I have to curtail that. And that's something in order to do that for myself that I need to be aware of and only do those things that I feel like I have time and energy to do that are not getting in the way of anything else. So there's that. Uh, okay, uh, anybody else on, on that task number two? I, um, <clears throat> I did this and then I put it, <laughs> I drew my circle on the iPad. So, I, cause I, um, I figured I'd be able to find it easy and I could come back to it easy, but it's really sloppy. But I found that a lot of what I'm thinking about now is this. And then I've been doing a yoga challenge. So that was part of my time. And I think I realized that I, I want to spend more time with friends, but maybe that comes later in this task list. <laughs> Well, she she said friendship and and play is is there. That's like play and romance, and then friendship. There they are. They are in there. And so if you are, you know, if you're finding that like oh, there's a lack here, that's a good, really good way of seeing it in that circle. Because I did my circle too, and I'm like, yeah, I, I want to see friends more. But I wonder how much of you not seeing people as much as you might want is COVID related. Like, are we living in weird times right now, oh, or yeah. is there some exactly yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because because I feel that way too. I'm like I want to see my friends, but there it's a lot tougher than you might think because we're living in some unprecedented times. So uh, your point is well taken, and I am there with you. All righty, uh, Megan. What are your thoughts on that task? Um. Honestly, my circle was pretty lopsided, and that was uh. Yeah, I got some thinking to do about that. <laughs> that that's all I'll say about that for now. Okay. No, no, no. That's great. And that's that's something like how satisfied are you? And if you are not satisfied, then like she said that early, I think, in, in the book, like with morning pages, there's only so long you can find yourself writing about the same damn thing before you realize you just have to do something about it. And it's the same kind of thing. Like when you see that circle and you're like, oh, I'm not seeing people I love enough or whatever, whatever the thing is that feels shortchanged, you, you, once you see it in graphic representation, you have to kind of do something about it, or at least it gives you food for thought. All righty. Anybody else want to chat about that before we move on to the things that you love doing? Mm-hmm. Okay. So did anybody write those things out? I did. Yeah. How, how was that? And, and what are your thoughts on sort of when the last time you did it and which ones, if you want to share, did you decide you want to do this week? Uh, Megan, why don't you go first? Um, well, I realized that a lot of my things are, uh, most of them are things I haven't done in, in years. And I think it's because I've had mm. a pretty intense focus on, on work, um, mm. for a while now. And part of that is also pandemic related. A lot of the things I really like doing are things that are really hard to do when things are shut down and, you know, you're worried about, um, COVID and everything. So, Sure. Um, one thing I decided to do this week, which I haven't done yet, is um, that I, I don't feel comfortable yet going back to the salon to get my hair done. But before I leave um, my parents' house and go back to New York, I, I want to get my mom to cut some of my hair off because it's getting she's getting so long and ragged. And I think I would just feel a little bit better in this sort of in-between time before I, I'm ready to go back to the salon if I had like less of weight on me, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a great that's a great one. Like, oh, yeah, I can do that kind of self-care and it doesn't have to be curtailed by COVID because someone else can can take a scissors and sort of trim my hair. And, and if and it feels lighter and better and all of those things, which I think is awesome. I did them and I have a bunch of stuff. And I have to say that 
a lot of the things that I love doing, I do. Right. Awesome. And I don't know if that makes me a, a particularly decadent person or, or whatever, but, I, but like, I, I, I put down dancing and walking and traveling and going out to eat, singing, petting my cats, writing, being in the water, going to a bookstore and browsing, wandering the streets of New York City, going to shows, blah, blah, blah. And I thought about it and I'm like, yeah, about the only thing that I haven't done for a while, I haven't played euchre, which is one of my favorite things to do. And I haven't taught people how to sing, like people who want to learn how to sing. I haven't spent time, I haven't had a, a, a singing workshop for a while. So now I'm like, well, even though that's work, it's one of my favorite things to do in the world is teach a group of people who are afraid to sing how to sing so that they're like, yay. And so so out of out of those things, like I love to take photos at night. I wanna take photos of the next eclipse. So yeah, I haven't done that for a while because we haven't had a big solar eclipse since 2017. And I feel like that's okay. But the other stuff I do, I actually make time for all of that in part because life is for the living right so i if i want to go see an uh, an alfred hitchcock movie or if i want to watch one at home by gum i'm gonna make myself some popcorn and i'm gonna go watch an alfred hitchcock movie because that's one of my favorite things to do so i will do that or i will drive to the ocean if i want to see the sunrise because why not right <laughs> if i can i'm going to and, and luckily the things that i love doing don't require a lot of people but if you if the things that you love doing require a lot of people like for example i have friends who are big time square dancers and uh they square dance virtually they actually square dance on zoom you will find a way if it's really important to you figure out a way to do it that is safe that doesn't put you in any danger like with COVID or whatever there are ways to do that and that's something for us to think about as we go through this process, and if you're listening to this as you go through the process for yourself, that a lot of the things that you love to do might not be accessible right now, but that doesn't mean that you can't do some form of it and and get yourself into that space regardless. All righty, uh, the 10 tiny changes, that was the next task, the 10 tiny changes, the things that you would like to do this week that that are slightly different that would be a change for you. Uh, did anybody have any particular ones that you want to uh, talk about that you made? Ten tiny changes, yeah. <clears throat> um, for me, I think that was probably one of the harder tasks. Um, not really hard to write down things that I wanted to change, but I guess just seeing the ones that were most important. And... Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'll just bring up two. One of them was that um, I would like to write more. And seeing that there was like, you know, kind of hard to see because I feel like that's the one thing that I've been trying to do the most, especially this year um, with the initiative I've taken um, in my creative endeavors. But I think what that meant was that, um, speaking of creative endeavors, like some of my creative writing, uh, my screenplays and short stories have taken the back burner to some of these other things that I've been involved with. Um, like, um, not just this, but also uh, freelancing, um, you know, just small writing jobs that I do regularly every week and things like that. Um, so that was one of them that I would like to write more. And then also another one that was really important for me on that list was that I need to call my grandmother more. Um, oh, sometimes I feel like- I love that sometimes I feel like such an awful grandson and you know she reminds me she she never calls me awful but she reminds me of how I don't reach out enough nearly enough and so um that's definitely for me not necessarily even a tiny change that's something that I think um is a big thing that I should that I should do it's just yeah reach out to my to my grandmother more I know not all of us have our grandparents with us and may they rest in peace if that's the case um but yeah, I think that's something that, that I definitely want to write more and call my Gmail more. I think that's lovely. And and frankly, uh, my my grandmothers have both passed and that's not a bad thing at all. They were terrible women. But uh, I would say that I, I call my mom and I make a note. I actually put a little thing in my calendar that every Sunday morning I need to call my mom. And so that's what I do. I actually have a little alarm go off that goes, 
remember to call your mother and uh and that's and that's how i call her once a week is that it's not up to me to remember because google calendar tells me that you know it's 9 a.m call your mother and that's a that, i love that i love leaving my brain more free to be creative because i'm not worried about the scheduling of things and that to me is is super important not not the calling my mother is cool and i'm glad i do it blah 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 but to have my brain free from remembering that stuff and the guilt sort of about the fact that i'm not doing it enough or whatever just isn't there because i have a little, a little reminder so that's my little piece of my little piece of advice to you if you feel like it it's a pretty cool thing to do all right that's cool awesome. uh yeah yeah oh thank you so anybody else anybody else well I, I'll, I'll i'll go because that sort of dovetails into one of mine which was I would like to have a schedule for my work in the artist way and writing is what I mean. So like I want to create more of a specific schedule. And when you said like, Oh, I just set my alarm for nine o'clock. I was like, well, that's amazing. That means you have that time set aside every week for that purpose. And that's awesome. Um, I live by schedules like that. Yeah. 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 yeah I definitely probably need more scheduling in my life. And, <clears throat> um, and that's it. The other one that was came to me, I was like, I did this list and I wrote a few things. And honestly, I don't think I really got to doing any of them, but some of them are sort of long-term things, I guess. Um, but then I was in on Facebook and somebody was like, I need to learn Spanish. And I was like, oh my God, I want to learn Spanish. And they put some list to some teacher and I was like, oh, I should be on my list. And I was like, do I really want it on my list? I always say I'm going to learn Spanish and then I don't. <laughs> and then I thought, Hey, maybe now you can, maybe now's the time. And you, and I sort of ex had this acceptance that I actually could learn it. And I, so I think that's, uh, that was sort of a little bit of the universe saying, don't forget this thing because it's part of my heritage and I should know it. Or I, I, I would like to know it. I would like to be more connected to my, mother my brother my family my cousins and speak their language or some of them i really appreciate that alan lots much mucho respect <laughs> muchas gracias yeah no 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 sí. y, y yo puedo practicar contigo si you say bueno, hey, bueno. so, good <laughs> absolutely i will totally I, I i can always stand to practice my spanish i love doing it so uh okay uh me i uh i have to, i have to no i get to and that's another thing that i'm trying to do is change the language between i have to and i get mm. to i get to do two episodes of the vegan life this week that's my other one of my other podcasts and that's a goal for me is to do two episodes of that show nice. and believe it or not i i mean i have a whole bunch of them like i would like to go for daily walks weather permitting i want to meditate more successfully i've been having a devil of a time meditating just because too many things are going on inside my brain playing the guitar more it's it's sitting here mocking me uh right now because i haven't i haven't opened the case for months and i really need to and want to uh but uh, honestly one of the big ones is i want to reorganize my tea i have a bunch of different kinds of tea and it, I never know where anything is, so I have a tough time when I want a cup of tea. I have a tough time figuring out which tea to get because I can't find the one I'm looking for. And and the, the other thing that I want to do is I want to go on a writing retreat. And I don't know if that's going to happen this week, but I really want to do a day. My, my goal, my desire is to go to Long Island and uh, by the end of the evening, I will be at Robert Moses Park and watching the sunset. But there's also a vegan massage therapist out there. So I want to make an appointment to get a massage and then go to my favorite vegan restaurant there and then find the closest library and go write for a few hours, like maybe four or five hours, and then go to the park, to the ocean and watch the sunset over the ocean and then head home. And that would be a perfect retreat for me. So that's that's a goal. Maybe not this coming week, but next week. There you go. I love that. Uh, all right. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun to do. And if I can free up the time to do it, I aim to do that very thing. All right, cool. Uh, the last thing that she asked is, was there anything that surprised you about either the morning pages or uh, your artist date? We may have already covered it. For me, it was that I started writing a book 
Is there anything that surprised you? Is there anything else that you want to say about what we've covered tonight? Because we've covered a lot. No, I think as far as me, I think I, I covered that earlier. And just like um, you, where you started writing the book, um, you know, I started that short story that I'm really excited about. And uh, I'm not cool. sure if, uh, if that's because of the morning pages or the artist way, but it's neat nonetheless. How about you, uh, Alan or Megan? I think for me, the most surprising thing, which I which I did mention a little bit earlier, was how morning pages and kind of the second half of the week really became a space for me to really start playing around with some new ideas instead of just a dumping ground for negativity. So that was really cool, surprising and, and really cool. That's awesome. Alan? Um, you know, obviously my dad writing to me and then this really <laughs> weird little extra... Um, half page that I did in the morning pages was really interesting. And then I think another thing that came to me, maybe when I was, <laughs> oh, when I was writing I was, okay. Here's the thing. So I was in the artist way, starting to read it and I was like, Ugh. I mean, it's, it's not clicking for me. And then I just started letting myself write in the book and underline things. <laughs> and I was like, this is really working for me and I have never let myself really write in the margins of a book and whenever I've highlighted a book I've always felt like guilty about it and I was just like this is my book I put my name in the front that I'm doing this and I get to do whatever I want with it and that was very exciting right. you, signed, you signed the contract right out. yeah I signed it right in the book and I was like this is for real so now I get to make little notes and some of it was just ideas that I was just writing in the margins and one idea I had was like a an art installation in and in a, like a piece that I had never would have ever comp contemplated prior to this and sort of like manifesting an idea in a sort of different uh, space than, than I usually think of stuff and it was just, I, I really loved the idea. And then, of course, I went through the cycles of, like, well, what's the practicalities of it? But I still like the idea, and I may come back to it. But that was cool. I hope you do. <laughs> that would be super cool. No, you know, it's really funny. Uh, I, I took this class at the Pit, the People's Improv Theater, took a stand-up comedy class, and had a great time. By the end of the class, we had five-minute sets. Everybody had five-minute sets. And one of the people in the class was this woman named Katie Chinakis, Kiriaki Chinakis is her name. And he said, it, Chris Griggs was our teacher, and he was like, yeah, you know, if you wanna, if you wanna do, uh, if you wanna do a show at the pit, there are ways to get that to happen. And we all went, oh, that's cool. And she went, I'm gonna put on a show. Mm -hmm. And so she went to the People's Improv Theater and she got them to give her the big room the big upstairs room which is the biggest space they have to do a variety show and i participated in two of them before covid shut us down uh because this we, we started this in january of, of 2020 and and it was it, she just went yeah we're gonna put it on and we did and that was that and so you don't i had not thought in my head that i would ever do stand-up comedy in that way but by gum within a couple months i was performing to a packed house doing stand-up comedy for a show that I was part of and then playing violin and da, da 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 all these other things and having a blast. And so I'm here to tell you that, you know, practicalities be damned. If you want to do it, there are ways to make it happen. And so I hope you will is is the point of this whole story. There you Thank go. You. I love that. I love that. If there's a will, there's a way. And that sounds like such an exciting show that you're a part of. <laughs> That's awesome. Alan, Alan, you it was super fun. I'm sorry, um, but Alan, that art installation sounds really cool too. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Yeah, if you ever wanted to to talk more about that with the group and needed any help, I'm sure we would uh, love to support. I don't mean to speak for the ladies. Sorry. <laughs> no, I I agree. I would totally be up for supporting it. I I don't know how I could, but I would be delighted to. So there you go. Because I've thought of doing art installations too with some of my digital art, and and that's something that's on the back burner because I don't know how to begin. But that doesn't mean that I won't. And so I would be delighted to see what you're doing, so I can steal from you <laughs> and see what worked for you. <laughs> have, <laughs> you. Have any of you heard of the Meow Wolf Collective? 
The what? Meow Wolf. I know it sounds ridiculous. It's this art collective. I think it started in Brooklyn. I just watched a, a documentary of it this past weekend. I would highly suggest uh, watching the Meow Wolf documentary. It's really silly, but it's essentially a group of artists that felt kind of alienated or like they couldn't be in these. Um, it's in, in Santa Fe, excuse me. I don't know why I thought Brooklyn in Santa Fe. They felt like they couldn't be a part of these uh, bigger kind of art scenes. So then mm. they started creating their own shows with these really wild art installations. And they ended up blowing up and becoming like a $50 million company at this point. Um, wow. It's really cool. Yeah, Meow Wolf. It's, it's really silly, though, too. Just just have that. Bear that in mind. Silly is yeah. good. Silly is fabulous. You forget to whom I married if you think I don't like silly. <laughs> All right. So... <laughs> Cool. Uh, I uh, Once again, all three of you, Alan and Megan and Sergio, I'm so grateful to you that you're doing this process because I think it's illuminating and inspiring and exciting and enticing and compelling. And I'm grateful to you for your thoughts and your ideas. Thank you so much for doing this. This is super cool. Well, I'm so happy to be doing it with you guys. And thank you for suggesting it, Zolda. This is great. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And next week, we are going to be meeting to talk about recovering a sense of power. That's week three. So there's going to be more of that. Is there anybody else who'd like to say anything else before I say goodbye for the night? Just thank you again. Thank you, oh, Zelda. Actually. It's been great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Zelda and crew. And thank you for all the listeners. Uh, so excited to continue this process. Awesome. Thank you. And Alan is hungry and wants to go do yoga. I totally get it. <laughs> All righty. If you've enjoyed today's episode, I would love, love, love. It would mean the world to me if you would review the show and let me and us know how you're thinking, what you're thinking, what's going on. Until next time for the Innovative Mindset Podcast, this is Isolde Attractamurg reminding you to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. <laughs>you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2021. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, remember to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. Thank you.